Last time we talked about a dilemma for rule consequentialism, and we have it on screen here. Either you're going to end up engaging in what's called rule worship, and that's where you just follow the rule no matter what, and the end result is going to be that the view kind of becomes incoherent, right? The rules are no longer set up so that they do maximize the good. So it seems like we would need to add uh, exceptions to these rules. But that leads to the other horn of the dilemma, what's called the collapse objection, where rule consequentialism just basically turns into act consequentialism, but with extra steps. If you miss that stuff or need a refresher, definitely look through it. I don't want to make this video longer than it needs to be because in this one, we're going to talk about like the rule consequentialist guy, Brad Hooker. Um, his view is really, really interesting and it's got a whole lot of nuance and it's sort of started its own like really big thing within the field of ethics. It's really fun to think about, so let's dive in. I mentioned this in the last video, but that dilemma that we've talked about, it had just been viewed as like so devastating to rule consequentialism that there is just no way to rescue the theory it was going to get impaled on one of these two horns of the dilemma and there's just nothing you can do about it and so especially from like the 1960s until the 1990s uh it was just sort of dead in the water but it saw revival thanks in most part to brad hooker's work on the view and him trying to solve this dilemma and it's such a cool idea you know, when you have something that's just so devastatingly objectionable to a view, it can be really hard to see how you could possibly wiggle your way around this. So what Hooker's going to do here is he's going to think about rules, not so much in the way that like this rule, if everybody followed it, would maximize the good. Instead, he's going to think about rules that are like just generally good rules to have and good rules to teach. And this is all kind of captured here on this slide. So I've got three principles here in mind. Hooker probably has more than these, but these are gonna be the most important, I think, to understand his view. So first off, when we are formulating these rules, we should not expect them to be uh, followed by everybody, right? We shouldn't think of them in terms of 100% compliance. Also, these rules should be internalizable, and we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. And then we also need to think about like what kind of societal impact these rules would have and how it would go about that we would teach these rules. This kind of ties in a little bit uh, to the second point here. But what we'll find is that if you, if you have a rule, or sorry, if you formulate rules in this general sort of way with these key ideas in mind, you're going to end up with a better system, one that actually does a better job of maximizing the good. Now, on this notion of compliance, so there's a couple of reasons why we wouldn't want to formulate rules as if everyone followed them. First, that's just not reasonable, right? Like, it's just a fact about humans that people are going to do wrong things at least sometimes. And so it's just not going to be a useful rule if we expect everybody to comply with it. It also, if we uh, were thinking about this in terms of everybody complying it, we would have no room for rules about retaliation, right? If you know that I have a rule that says that I'm going to retaliate against all attackers, you're probably going to be a lot less likely to attack me. But we, if we're thinking about this in terms of 100% compliance, then a rule about retaliation doesn't make any sense. So there you go. Now, as far as what we mean by internalizable, this is a little bit tricky. But I think once you start to see some examples, it'll kind of make sense. So what we mean by internalizable, a rule that is internalizable is one that people will actually follow and that people will recognize as good rules to follow. And this ties into that third point about like how, you know, it's introduced to society and how that introduction might benefit society because, you know, rules that are good to follow are also good to teach.
to, you know, like young kids or to the next generation or whatever. Now, what we're talking about here, internalization is uh, a term that like that Hooker uses in a very specific way. So it's not mere compliance. It's not just doing what the rule says. Somebody who complies with the rule, you know, they just do what the rule says because that's what the rule says. They're not really engaged in the process of thinking about the rule. Somebody who internalizes a rule, like they know what it says, so they have it, you know, sort of memorized, but they also recognize it as a good rule. So somebody who's internalized it, and if they're recognizing it as a good rule, then they will have a disposition, a tendency to follow what that rule says. Will they do it all the time? No, we're human, right? We're gonna do wrongful things sometimes. But they just have a, a sort of behavioral attitude or, or a, I mean, what's just the fancy word for it is a disposition, just a, a general tendency to follow that rule. And again, not because it's a rule necessarily, but because they recognize it's a good rule to have. Um, so I've got a, a comparison here that might help, right? I'm gonna do my homework because I'm gonna get a grade for it. That's complying with the rule about you know doing your homework. Versus I'm gonna do my homework because I actually know I need the practice. Notice I've internalized this and presumably if that's the process I'm engaged in, I'm actually gonna get more out of doing that homework than somebody who's just going through the motions. Um, if you drive, I mean, uh, most people drive, but uh, speed limits are one of those things that we generally recognize as a good rule to have, but we also sort of understand what that rule is about. And, you know, it's like, well, given that, you know, there are houses, so residences in here, or given that this is a four lane highway, you know, uh, the speed limit can vary. Uh, depending on how curvy the road is and all kinds of stuff goes into it. But in general, we recognize that those speed limit signs are there because they sort of give you a suggestion of a safe speed at which to travel. And I mean, everybody speeds, but you know, the general idea there is that you do recognize speed limits as a generally good rule to have. Uh, just like, I mean, a lot of traffic laws are like that. You stop at a red light because otherwise there would just be complete anarchy at intersections. Nobody would ever get anywhere that they're going. Do you occasionally run red lights? Like, yeah, probably. I mean, most people do, but that still doesn't mean that you don't recognize that it's a good rule to have. So that's what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about internalize or internalization or internalizability. Now, there's gonna be some really cool results by requiring this element to rules. So first, every rule that we introduce in our system is gonna have a cost associated with it. And some rules, right, like might be a little bit costlier than others. And by this, I don't mean like they're hard to follow, although that might be part of it. But what we're talking about here is just the mental cost of like learning and understanding what the rule is, the time cost of like teaching it to future generations and things like that. So there is always a cost associated with a rule. Um, and so what that means is we shouldn't just arbitrarily introduce rules unless they're needed, right? So I've got an example here that like rules about not like harming Martians. Like, I mean, that's a fine rule to have, but like there aren't any Martians. So there's a cost associated with it. And, you know, if we talked about it, we'd be like, yeah, okay. You know, if I meet a Martian, fine, I'm not going to harm it. But even that minor cost, there's literally no benefit to it. So we ought not introduce a rule like that. It wouldn't, once we situate it in society, it wouldn't have a, it wouldn't maximize the good because we'd learn it, but we'd never have the chance to ever apply it. Um, and... A key idea here, remember how we were trying to decide, like, should we add exceptions to these rules or not? Well, every exception that we add to a rule increases the cost associated with internalizing it, just because it's like a little bit more complicated now. And the more exceptions you add, the more complicated that it gets and the costlier that it gets to internalize it.
And so you can imagine, right, if we took from the last video our don't kill rule and then added all of those bajillion exceptions to it, that's incredibly costly to internalize, if not impossible, right? And forget about, you know, trying to teach it to the next generation if we can't learn it in the first place. So we're not going to be adding exceptions to these rules at all. If it says don't kill, that's what it says. If it says don't steal, that's what it says. So we don't have to worry about the collapse objection. Rule consequentialism, remember it only collapses into act consequentialism because of these exceptions. Well, if we don't have exceptions, then it can't collapse. So we're good there. But do you remember the other horn of the dilemma, right? This idea of rule worship. How are we going to avoid this like situation wherein we might find ourselves in a situation where killing or stealing or something like that is so obviously better that it just seems foolish to comply with the rule? The way Hooker gets around this is he adds one extra rule to the set. And this rule says, follow all rules, except when doing so would lead to disaster. This is sort of like a disaster clause. It's an additional rule that we're going to add. And so remember, um, this is not an exception to the rule, because what we'd have to do is change every single rule in the system. Don't kill except when killing would avert disaster. Don't steal except when kill stealing would, right? And we have to do that to every single rule. So it would make the overall cost of the system for internalization, it would make that just kind of shoot up. So instead, it's just this one rule that's sort of about rules. It's like a meta rule. And it's just telling you, hey, follow the rules unless doing so would lead to disaster. And that is supposed to be, at least, the way that he avoids this dilemma. And at the face of it, it looks pretty successful. I mean, we have seen now a whole lot of work being done on rule consequentialism since the 90s, since this sort of got revitalized, and it's still ongoing stuff. Now, one thing to keep in mind, and this will kind of be important for the discussion post, we're going to be comparing these two views and, and you'll have to sort of tell me which one you think is better. And by better, I don't mean that you like agree with it, you know, but, you know, uh, I might have given this example in the instructions, but like, you know, you might argue that Brussels sprouts are better than, I don't know, cyanide, but that doesn't mean you like Brussels sprouts. So, you know, you can argue that a view is better than this other view, even if you don't agree with either one. And that's what philosophy is all about, man, like being able to argue for positions cleanly and clearly. Um, but if Hooker is to be successful, he needs to be able to show that his view has at least as much explanatory power as act consequentialism. And what that really kind of boils down to is, you know, getting a lot more cases right, for example, matching up more with our intuitions, and definitely for sure avoiding this dilemma. But I do want to quickly look at a couple of objections here. Uh, the first one, and this is actually kind of, I'm worried this is going to be too tricky to follow. So this is more for like, I just find it an interesting objection. I wouldn't test on something like this. But with rule consequentialism, right, the rules can change depending on if the situation on the ground changes. And so these rules depend on a lot of contingent facts about the way the world is. In other words, the, the world is a certain way, but it didn't have to be that way, right? So we have a very particular evolutionary history and a very particular sort of psychological makeup and brain chemistry. Um, just the, the facts about the world and, and who's starving and who's suffering, right? Those are also facts that, you know, might not have been true. And so you could sort of imagine a world that's like quite different from ours, that humans are very different psychologically and, and all this.
And it could be the case that this world has just an entirely different set of rules for rule consequentialism. And the objection here is that, you know, if morality is like objective, if it's like an actual thing, it seems like there's at least some moral truths that would be true in, in every world, no matter what kind of world you could imagine. That's the general idea behind this objection. I think it's really interesting to think about, but it gets pretty tricky immediately because we're sort of talking about possible worlds and, and sort of metaphysics stuff that you're not going to know a whole lot about. But I will say, uh, the, one of the bonus things that we do is considering rule consequentialism in a world where there's a zombie apocalypse. So, you know, it's not um, completely unconnected to like other assessments in the course. Um, another sort of tricky thing, and I do think this is probably going to be a genuine problem for the view, is what are we going to do in cases where we have two conflicting rules and they're each telling us to do something different. Um, the case that I have here, I might have even gotten this from Kant or maybe uh, W.D. Ross, I can't remember, this is not my case, but you've got somebody who promises his ailing mother that, you know, like he'll care for her instead of, you know, like sending her off somewhere, you know, he'll take care of her in, in her final days. But then he gets drafted or called up to war. And so he also has this like commitment to his country or something like that. And so this does seem like a genuine moral dilemma, right? He's got a promise that he made to his mom and a duty to sort of serve his country or something like that. And it seems like there would be rules that have to do with this somewhere in place. You know, don't break promises. Uh, do fulfill, you know, duties to people, something like that. So any kind of like real genuine moral dilemma looks like it's going to have a hard time uh, being handled by rule consequentialism when those rules conflict. And lastly, and you might have already seen this one because, you know, as soon as I mentioned that disaster clause, students are like, well, what's a disaster? And that's a really good question that does not have a very good answer. Disaster, as a notion, seems to be incredibly vague. Um, I mean, if we go back to that sheriff case from uh, JJC Smart, right, you could make the case that the innocent man, if you hand him over and they execute him, that that's a disaster. But if they torch the town, that also seems like a disaster. So like, do disasters come in degrees? Are both of those a disaster? Is like it just sort of subjective and just up to you to determine whether something is, is a disaster? Like that wouldn't be a great result. So we need some kind of rigorous methodology, decision procedure for figuring out if some possible outcome is a disaster so that we know that we need to avoid it in order to follow that rule. So. This is the one that I think is probably going to be the most problematic because it just ties in so directly with how Hooker handles the dilemma that we've been looking at. If, if this disaster clause doesn't work, then he falls back on that horn of rule worship. And that's not going to be a very good outcome for him. But that's going to do it for rule consequentialism. The stuff on this slide um, if you're not looking, like pause it and look. I don't want to have to to read through it, but these are the things that I really want you to understand walking away from this module, um, and just be able to discuss coherently. And these are things you'll be, you know, tested on, assessed on. One last little thing in closing. You might not remember this. It's been a little bit. I guess it's only been one module, but I don't know. In my head, it feels like forever. But Hume's argument against sort of moral objectivism. If you remember, so this was one of the arguments that we looked at, and it relies on this idea of, look, the only kinds of sort of objective truths that are out there are relations of ideas and matters of fact. So things like two plus two is four, or, you know, Earth is the third planet from the sun, right? Stuff you can go out and investigate, or that you can just understand in, by like understanding the terms involved. And Hume says, look, moral truths aren't either of those things. Premise three here, 
is especially important. Moral truths are not empirical matters of fact. But aren't they? I mean, this entire time we've been talking about thinking about like how, you know, different uh, views or different actions can affect people in the world, how we can learn new information and include that kind of stuff in our moral thinking. And so it looks as though both act and rule consequentialism are enough to show that this premise is at least problematic, if not just completely false. Both of these views seem to be um, just based on empirical stuff. And that's a very cool idea. So that's going to do it for consequentialism. In the next module, we'll be looking at the other really big ethical theory called deontology. In the meantime, let me know if you have any questions. Get your reading quizzes done, get your module tests done, and we'll talk about deontology in the next module.